Greetings, this is Pastor Perry Collis at Grace Point Church. We're continuing in our study that we've been calling our true identity in Christ. Uh, we're at, toward the end of chapter one. And I've, I've called today's message taken from Ephesians chapter one, verses 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. I've called it the Apostle Paul's purposeful prayer list. In just a moment, I'm going to read to you the passage, a few verses on either side of it, to help us declare the truth and authority of God's Word today. First of all, allow me to pray and ask God to bless the truth of His Word as we seek to apply it to our daily lives. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the authority of your Word. In a day and age where there is lots of information, but sometimes not always a lot of wisdom, we pray that the authority of your word would speak deeply into our hearts through the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. And I pray that this passage in particular makes an impact upon us as we continue through the month of October in the year 2020. We love you and open our hearts to you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to encourage you to turn them to the book of Ephesians. We're going to be looking, as I said, at Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to start with verse 13 and read down through verse 20. And we'll be looking only at the last couple of verses of this passage. But I think it's good for us to hear what the Apostle Paul says as he sets this passage up. Ephesians 1, beginning at verse 13. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. And for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, so that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of His great might, that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in heavenly places." This is the Word of God. How do you picture God when you are praying? Uh, let me illustrate something for you that I found helpful that I, I think you might as well. We as parents get lots of requests from our kids. They beg us for things all the time or, or want things from us. But imagine a parent's reaction to a, to a child of theirs who asks, something like this. Maybe a, a, a little guy comes up to his mom and says, Mom, could you show me how to clean my room so that it makes you happy? Or maybe a little guy comes up to his dad and says, Dad, I'd like to go out and wash your car. Would you come out and show me how to do it in a way that would make you happy? Or, or maybe a, a child comes to their parents, uh, the child is a teenager, and says, you know, Dad and Mom, I have watched how it is that you show love to each other, and, and I so appreciate what I see that I want my marriage to be like yours. Can you tell me a little bit about how I can plan for that now as a child? Now, I know these requests I just give you from a child to a parent seem a little fanciful, and most parents might just drop over dead from shock if a child asked a question like that, but don't lose the point. A child who would ask those kinds of questions of a parent would really be asking for help doing something that's already what their parents want for them. It, in, the sen in essence, it's asking something according to the will of the parents. Applied to a spiritual truth, that illustration would be called prayer. And the reason for that illustration and the reason it feels so odd is because it's so counterintuitive to how we normally view prayer. Oftentimes, our usual pattern of prayer is to ask for stuff that we want instead of asking for things that God already wants. You could say it like this, my most effective prayers will always be those where I ask my Heavenly Father for something He already wants for me. In other words, according to the will of God. Now, lest you think I'm simply making up some new power of positive thinking for a prayer principle, answer this question based on the passage I just read for you. What does the Apostle Paul 
ask for for these Ephesians that God already wants these believers to have. That's important to keep in mind. Let me again give you some background to some of the things we're talking about here. Paul begins this section of his prayer for the Ephesians by telling the Ephesians believers, listen, I've heard some good things about you. It's found there in, in verse 15. I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love towards the saints. Wouldn't it be great if, if we told that to people? We went up to someone and said, I heard something good about you. So is Paul just spinning the truth here to make them feel good about themselves? After all, how would Paul hear about the good things going on there at Ephesus in that church? It's been four years since Paul even personally visited there. There were no phones, no, no ways to send a text message or an email. There was no Facebook. Besides, remember, the Apostle Paul is writing this from jail in Rome, 1,700 miles away. Well, Paul had heard about it the old-fashioned way. We call it gossip. Word of mouth in the marketplaces where he'd been, or maybe on the shipping docks when he was going from place to place, or maybe when he was walking on the roads, going from one location of a missionary journey to another, or in this case, through the prison bars behind which he is jailed for declaring the gospel. Paul had heard on the winds of gossip two things about these people in Ephesus and the church. And what were these two things? Oh, nothing. Just, first of all, about their faith in Jesus Christ, and secondly, how they loved each other. Paul doesn't mention that in this gossip he had heard about how many people were attending their services, or what their favorite church programs were, or what they were arguing about, or what their church budget was, or how other churches around them were doing. No, he had heard about their faith in Jesus Christ, how strong it was, and how they loved each other. And that's what motivated Paul to pray for them with great thanksgiving. Wouldn't it be something if people uh, sat around here in Lodi in a restaurant and gossiped about Grace Point Church, either on Facebook or with each other, about things like our faith in Jesus Christ? Wouldn't it be something if, if Jesus were so central to our church that he was mentioned more than our buildings or our programs? And, and that further they would gossip about, did you see how much those people at that church love each other? Not just the people who agree with them or, or not just the people who are their same age or, or like their, their styles or their opinions, but all the saints. They love them all. I thought of that and I thought, may God grant each of us to know the joy of someday becoming victims of that kind of great gossip. Back to verse 15. Paul says, for this reason, I'm going to pray for you. And what is this reason? Well, it refers back to, if you've been listening to previous sermons, to this very long run-on sentence that begins in verse 3 and goes all the way to verse 14. In that long run-on sentence of doctrine, the Apostle Paul is, is announcing how God the Father chose us to be part of his adopted family, how God the Son paid the ransom price with his death on the cross to free us from sin, and how last week we talked about how God the Holy Spirit guarantees with his presence in our lives an eternal rich inheritance for us. And in light of all of that, and because the Ephesians show great faith in Jesus Christ and great love for each other. Paul says, I want you to know what I'm praying for, for you. And in short, Paul is saying, I'm going to ask for more things that God already wants for you. How would my prayer life be different if I began regularly praying for more of what God already wants for other people and in the world? Here's the big idea for the sermon today. True godly prayers come from the hearts of people that deeply desire more of God himself rather than wanting more from God for myself. Again, keep in mind who Paul is writing to and where he's writing from. He's, as I mentioned, in prison in Rome. He's 1,700 miles away from this church in Ephesus. And if you remember from some of our first sermons, the church at Ephesus originally had been planted about 10 years earlier in the middle of a riot. Uh, the idol worshipers in, in Ephesus had rioted against Paul and, and the believers there who were 
preaching the gospel because it was interrupting their worship of the goddess Diana. Now certainly, in a church like that, you would think there'd be lots of things for the Apostle Paul to pray very specifically about for the church there in Ephesus. Maybe things like for their safety, for their health, for their encouragement, from, for protection from financial and social persecution. But instead, Paul begins with some very specific, what we might call purpose prayers in light of who God is and who the church is. And notice that before even get before Paul even got to the for the personal part of this prayer life, he had first covered 11 verses of very important doctrine or teaching about who God is. But what does all this doctrine in the first chapter have to do with living Christ in my daily from in my daily life here in San Joaquin Valley in Northern California? Well, here's the answer. It seems to be a principle throughout the New Testament, especially in Paul's letters, that he first begins with doctrine and then talks about how knowing that helps us live out our life. For example, in the book of Romans, there are 11 chapters of important doctrine followed by chapter 12, which says, in light of all of that, here's how to live that out. In Galatians, there are four chapters of doctrine about God. And then chapter 5, says things like, get rid of works of the flesh and, and instead work out the fruits of the Spirit. Bear with each other's burdens. The same thing happens in the book of Philippians. Paul has three chapters of deep doctrine. And then chapter 4, where he says things like, don't worry, don't be anxious, live in joy. And finally, the book of Colossians, two chapters of doctrine about who Christ is, followed by two more chapters about how this all now should be worked out in your moral life, in your worship, in your home life, and in your work. Clearly, Paul was inspired time after time in these letters that he wrote to write in such a way that a, a believer's position in Christ is the starting point from which I build my practice in Christ. I will rarely serve Christ more effectively than what I know about him from his word. So Paul clearly believes that the effectiveness of any church in Jesus Christ begins with believers understanding who God is and what the gospel message is and then living it out. So again, for the second time, let me review what we've learned so far. We've learned we've been chosen before the foundation of the earth to be part of God's family. We've learned secondly that we've been redeemed. The price for our freedom from sin is the, the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. And thirdly, we've been signed, sealed, and delivered by the Holy Spirit living within us and assured of an eternal inheritance in heaven someday. So in light of that, how could we pray for each other? Let me share with you three ways that we could practically pray for each other based on what the Apostle Paul shows us here. Number one, I should pray that you would know God personally. Take a look at verse 17. Paul says, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I think there is often a huge gap between who God really is and who we think he is in our hearts and minds. It's a gap caused by, I think, what we'd call a naturally occurring illness in humans called sin. My ability to clearly understand and know God was terribly damaged and destroyed by the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And they passed that on through their line to all of us as human beings. Our sin nature not only results in the eventual physical death of all humans, but also in the death of our ability to clearly fathom who God is. Paul says it this way to the Corinthian believers in 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Let me just give you a warning here that what I'm about to say now in applying that principle here might sound a little stern, but it's true. If week after week you hear the Word of God read to you, explained to you, and it makes no sense to you, I suppose I could admit some personal blame to being a less than perfect communicator, but you should know if, if there's a pattern of hearing God's word and it not making sense to you that you may not be 
alive spiritually. For God's word to make sense, you have to be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, repent of your own sin and selfishness, surrender to his authority as your creator and redeemer so that you can fully accept the truth of God's word. Both those things we love hearing about and those things that are sometimes hard to hear about. For the most part, we live in a world that, well, misunderstands God as their way of life. The atheist claims there is no God for us to know. The agnostic claims there's a God, but we can't know him. And the vast majority of humanity, especially in America today, has blindly and proudly named themselves secularists. In other words, I don't believe in any God. I, I just believe in humanity. As if giving a, a high-sounding name makes it sound more noble than what we really are. Sinners headed for eternity, separated from our Creator. Now, godlessness may be the natural state of humanity, but something had happened to these Ephesian believers. Something supernatural happens to all of us who are believers. Ephesians 1.13, we talked about it last week. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Those Ephesians had gone from being outsiders to being insiders in God's own family. If indeed, as it says negatively in 1 Corinthians 2.14, that the person without the Spirit of God living in them cannot accept the things that come from God, then it also means, to state it positively, that the person who does know God through his Son Jesus Christ and has the Spirit living in them now has the ability to understand God. Have you ever been sitting at a table in a, in a close family and, and they're talking with each other and laughing and joking and suddenly they start telling one of those insider family stories and as, as someone is talking, the rest of the family starts laughing or giggling even before they get to the end of the story. And you can just see that there is joy connected with the story, but because you're an outsider, although you can see they're having fun with the story, you don't, you weren't there, you don't really know what it was like. But what if, what if it just so happened that they adopted you into their family and they started including you in their great stories and you became part of them and they talked about what a joy it was for you to become part of that family and you became part of more and more of their stories. Well, that's exactly what's going on here, spiritually speaking. Through Christ's redemption, we, former outsiders, by God's grace and mercy, not because we're such great people, we've been given the amazing opportunity to stop misunderstanding God. We are freed from our wrong and fatal misconceptions about God, and instead, we can start growing into His family. We start by being adopted into his family and getting to know God through what we call salvation of our souls. John 17, 3, where Jesus said, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And then secondly, once we're born into the family, we, we start to increase our knowledge of God and of the family of God. It says in Philippians 3, 10, I pray that you may know him and the power of his resurrection. We might even call that growing in Christ, or the fancy word for it is sanctification. And then finally, we're assured that someday, for believers, on what we would call our victorious death day, or when Jesus Christ returns a second time, we will come to know him perfectly. We could call that our glorification in the family. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, Now I only know in part, but then someday, I shall fully know even as I have been fully known by God. And God intends that even our life here at our local church at Grace Point Family Now should be kind of a, let's call it a practice dress rehearsal for the perfect eternity we will share with God's family in heaven. No wonder Paul writes it like this in verses 16 and 17. In light of all this, he says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and in revelation in the knowledge of him. Paul's praying for this very thing for the Ephesian believers. 
When was the last time you or I prayed for that, for other believers? Maybe even in our own physical family, for our spouse or our children. I know, we, we pray for each other's health. We pray for each other's finances, our jobs, our families. But is there not a greater need in the church in America today for God's people to pray that their pastors and leaders and each other would gain and grow a deeper knowledge of who God is and then live according to that? The word knowledge of them here is not just a request, you know, I'm praying for you that you would know more Bible trivia questions on the Final Jeopardy game. No, it's having a close knowledge and personal connection with someone to know someone. I pray that they would know you, God, and you would be united with them in a special way. Jesus Christ shed his blood to purchase us so that we would increasingly know what God our Heavenly Father wants and then ask Him for those things. How would it look if we were to pray that? I think it would mean that every believer would have an increased appetite and hunger for God's Word. I, I think it would mean that in our small group meetings and our Bible study meetings and, and after every sermon or time of worship together that we would end those times with a greater stirring in our heart to be obedient, and find delight in obedience of God. I think it would mean that every believer I pray for would intentionally start making choices and carry attitudes that are more about God than about themselves. Do you see why we should be praying for each other to have daily revelations about who God is and then living in light of that? So, secondly, not only should I pray to know God purposefully, secondly, I should pray that you would know God purposefully. Verse 18. Let me read that passage for you. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. The human soul was created by God in his image to live beyond this temporary time of just mere survival. Unfortunately, without God's redeeming transformation, we as sinful humans naturally fall into what you might call boring patterns of maintenance, existence, and survival, one day after the next. How dreadful. Paul's second prayer is that we as redeemed, adopted children of God would live up to the hope of our eternal calling. The word called there in Greek is the word kaleo. It's an important word in the New Testament vocabulary. In fact, it means literally an issue or a command to do something. For example, it was used by Jesus in the parables, that parable of the workers when they were called in from the field to receive their, ages, uh, their wages. Or another parable where Jesus goes out and calls people to come to a banquet. Obedience to this kind of call meant it benefited both the caller and the callee, the one being called. What's interesting is that the church in Greek is the word ekklesia. From that word, it means those who are called out of the world and given a command to live for Christ. Not, not a mere boring pattern of survival and existence and maintenance, but with purpose. Our church, all churches that follow Jesus Christ, exist for the purpose of reflecting God's grace, good news, and glory to the rest of the world. It's a hopeful calling with eternal consequences. It's not a boring, weary calling that we should treat like an optional sales call by a carnival hawker saying, come over here. No, I think sadly too often that's the way Christians view their calling as, oh, that's boring. But keep in mind that the word hope in the Bible never means wish or hope for, like a child hoping for a Christmas toy. No, instead the word carries with it the assurance of a hopeful future. That's why the second coming of Christ is called in the book of Titus our blessed hope, our smiled upon hope for eternity. A believer's hope is, of course, in the return of Christ for his church, but it's also a, a living hope that allows us to live daily until that time or until God calls us home with a sense of purpose. 
we, we humans constantly confuse, I think, what you'd call earthly prices with heavenly values. The city of Ephesus that Paul is writing to, where the church is, was actually known as a very wealthy city. It boasted of the temple of the goddess Diana, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. But all of that ancient wealth, that part of the seven wonders are today gone. There's no splendor there. But the Christians who once lived there are at this very moment, while you're listening to the sermon, already living in God's presence. Literally every single physical thing that you and I lay claim to will sooner or later be worth absolutely nothing to us. Nothing. While on the other hand, the unseen things like the faith and trust we put in eternal God and our adoption into his family that the world sometimes mocks us for believing today will one day burst into its full value in the eternal realm. And that eternal hope should be my driving force as a believer, encouraging me to live pure and to live obedient and to live faithful. Just the thought and the fact that one day I will see Christ face to face and be like him should motivate me every day. Even when, I, when I'm struggling with the things around me and the newspaper articles and all the stuff going on in this, in this political season, it should motivate me to wake up with hope and confidence. And since we know God already wants that, we should have no trouble play, praying for that for one another. Thirdly and finally, let me unpack one more thing for you. And, and, and in a couple weeks, I will do a little more with this passage. But third, the third thing is, I should pray that you would know God powerfully. Not just personally, not just purposefully, but powerfully. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. Paul says, and I pray that they would know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. You know, I read that passage and I think, you know, for a man sitting in prison without a dictionary or a thesaurus or anything else, Paul goes a little over the top here in just these two verses by using four distinct words to talk about the power of God. He kind of jams them all together. He uses the words immeasurable and greatness and power and working. Uh, you could translate or paraphrase the verse a little like this. Paul is asking, what is the spiritual mega dynamite towards us who believe? And then he answers his own question. It is the divine, dynamic, eternal energy that raised Jesus from the dead, seated him in all dominion and power, and all that power is made available to little old us believers that we might bring glory to God. I know I've taken some liberty with, with that, but let's be honest. That's what he's essentially saying. Now, for us as humans to be given power is kind of a dangerous thing. I mean, remember back, it may have started out when it was your turn to be a hall monitor in grade two, and you were given that power. Maybe later on in college, you were a teacher's assistant, or maybe you became a supervisor at work. And, and as you kind of grew up, you learned that not everybody does well by being given power. But God intends that we as his children become better servants of his by him giving us the power of his Holy Spirit. Now, at first glance, it might be tempting to view this awesome power, immeasurably great, as Paul puts it, as kind of a personal possession for us as believers to exercise for our own benefit. But God aimed this power toward us and then transformed us so that we might see his majesty and give him glory by the way we live our lives, by the way we choose to, to use words and convey attitudes. And it's that very power that has allowed me as a pastor over the last number of decades to stand by literally hundreds of grave sites and assure the families of their loved one's place in the now and eternally blessed presence of God. It's that power that allows us to revel in the thought that millions of people throughout history 
who were once helplessly held in the grip of sin and assured of only being in hell, separated from God eternally, have had their lives transformed, their souls saved to live life to live lives of purpose now with the hope of eternity later. And we'll be given new bodies that won't break down with age or disease or viruses. And God has transformed his children to carry this incredibly good news to the lost world around us. Copper wire. It, it can be used for a lot of different purposes because it is strong and yet it's, it's pliable. You can use it for a clothesline. You could use it to turn into copper pipes that are easily bendable for plumbing in your house. You could use it to, to turn it into jewelry because it's easily bendable. Florists find it especially helpful for holding together flower arrangements. But all those are what we might call mere convenience uses. But there is by far a far more effective use for copper wire. You see, of all the, the metals, copper atoms have the widest free path between their molecules, which allows electrical currents to move quickly through them. It's called being a conductor. So although copper can be easily used for other stuff, its best use is to carry power for electricity to turn on lights, to power tools, to run industry. Only when it's connected to a power source is copper's full potential brought into being. I illustrate our lives as believers with copper wire. You see, as humans, we're easily bent, we're easily twisted, we're easily manipulated, sometimes by our own feelings, sometimes by the deceit of, of Satan, the selfishness of our own sinful nature. But now, transformed by the power of Jesus Christ, when we get connected to our power source, our living God, the living presence of God, we can carry the good news. We can be conductors of the good news of Jesus Christ. You see, we must remember this. Power lines, even copper ones, don't ever produce the power. They only transmit the power where it's needed. God's plan for the gospel, the good news of Jesus' death for our sin, his resurrection from the dead, is God's power running through you and me to light this dark world with hope. The power to save souls isn't ours. Not a one of us can save a single soul. It's all God's, and it's only through our submission and obedience and pliability to Him in our hearts and lives that we can best conduct this message of good news. I think any church of any size, ours or any faithful church, even a small church, has enough power poles and power lines, people, to transmit this message clearly in our world today. I think we need to, however, stop praying for God's power to give us what we want and start praying more and more for God's power to give us what he already wants. They can light up entire neighborhoods with God's truth. It's time for us to begin as believers as much as possible, asking God for what is best, what is his best. I had a brilliant high school science teacher. He was actually a great teacher. He was a little eccentric, but, but a really positive teacher. He wore a huge diamond ring, even though he was a single man. And when we, as students, asked him about this diamond ring, he told the story about how his dad had offered him and his brother the choice at graduation. That when they graduated, they could either have a brand new car or have a, a, a diamond ring worth the same value. He told about how his brother chose a brand new car. Most of us would. He instead chose a, a, di a gold diamond ring. And then he held up the ring, and I remember him saying something like this, that 10 years now after his high school graduation, his brother's new car was no longer around, but he had a diamond ring that had increased in value. And then he said something like this to us, always ask for the stuff that lasts. Always ask for the stuff that lasts. At the time, he was not referring to spiritual things, but I think you would agree that that saying, always ask for the stuff that lasts, makes even more serious sense as a spiritual principle than as a mere temporary financial one. Write this down. 
God always transforms his children who ask for the stuff that really lasts, like knowing him personally, or knowing him purposefully, or knowing him powerfully. Let's make that part of our closing prayer. In just a moment, I'm going to pray part of this passage for you. I want to remind you to stay connected on board here. We will have a worship song, an important worship song, Knowing You, written a number of years ago that talks about how all I once held dear and based my life upon, I'm sweeping aside because knowing you, Jesus, knowing you is all that really matters. Allow that song to speak to your heart and then stay on board. I have some study questions here that I think will help you make some applications for what we've talked about today. Would you bow with me as I offer this prayer? Heavenly Father, I pray that the people who are listening in today, that, that, that even for myself, that we may know what is the hope to which you've called us. And we may value and know the riches of your glory in our lives. And that you've promised us an inheritance. And I pray, Father, that we might know you this week more personally, more purposefully, and more powerfully in thought, word, and deed. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.